Hello again, Fight Fans. Welcome to episode number 320 of the Neutral Corner Boxing Podcast. I am your host, Michael Montero for ringmagazine.com. And as you can see, the August issue with the great Katie Taylor, undisputed lightweight women's champion of the world on the cover, is out in stores. Make sure you check it out now. But uh, I am your host for Ring Magazine. And of course, ringtv.com and the Ring Digital YouTube channel where you are checking me out live right now. As always, I ask you guys, remind you guys, make sure that you're subscribed because YouTube likes to do this thing where they unsubscribe people for no reason. So make sure that you're subscribed and you click that notification bell so you never miss a live video. Also, make sure you check out my personal channel, Montero Unboxing. Make sure you're subscribed over there because they really like to unsubscribe you over there and click that notification bell as well. Uh, look, we don't charge a fee for this show. There's no ads. And believe me, I get offers to do all kinds of sponsorship stuff on this show as we continue to grow internationally in the boxing community. Uh, and, and I turn that down. And it's something that I've talked about with Doug, uh, Doug Fisher, of, great, uh, of course, the great Doug Fisher um, at Ring. And uh, we want to keep this thing ad-free. We just want word of mouth. That's all we need to get the show out there. So the fee for this show is non-monetary. All I ask is you guys spread the word. All right. If you get something out of it, if you have a good time, you have some fun, man, just tweet it out, share it on your social media. I know all of you guys are on social. All right. There's a thousand apps I've never even heard of TikTok and all this other shit. <laughs> just share the show on one of those every episode. That's it. That's all you got to do. That's the fee. All right. So pay your fee. And then we can get right into this. Um, some news and notes. Let me jump into that uh, real quick because we got some housekeeping stuff. So, look, uh, next Monday is the Independence Day holiday here in the United States, July 4th holiday. So, we will not have a TNC next week. Okay. No TNC next week. And we're not doing the Friday wrap up over on my channel this Friday. So, I will be hanging out with family this long weekend and enjoying my time. And uh, for those of you who uh, want to get all your updates on the, the schedule over the next couple of weeks, don't worry. We're going to do that here in this episode of the show, all right? But we're not going to be back for TNC until next, next Monday, July uh, 11th. We, so next week, we will not have TNC, but we will have the Friday wrap-up. Then the Monday after that, TNC is back, okay? So this will be the last show for uh, about a week or so. All right. So we're going to have some fun today. We'll cover everything. There's not a whole lot going on, but there's some stuff to review. All right. Including uh, this weekend, I think we saw a young star. I, I really don't even want to say breaking through because I think he already broke through with his uh, performance earlier this year, but he just further broke through with this last performance. We'll talk about that. And then we got some stuff to preview for the next couple of weeks. Okay. So we're kind of in the dog days of summer. There's no super big fights right now but there's still plenty going on and things are setting up for a really really big fall uh it's really going to start in august but august i really think through the end of the year we're going to have several big fights to talk about all over the world so that's going to be a lot of fun man this is shaping up to be a pretty damn good year in the sport we've had uh plenty to talk about and, and, and cheer for and i think that 2022 the biggest thing we are going to get, you know, we're going to get a few super fights. Of course, the, the Glovkin and Canelo rubber match. Of course, the rematch between Usyk and Joshua. We may get Spence and Crawford, but I'm starting to get pessimistic. I'm going to, I'm going to remain optimistic as much as I can, but eh, we'll see. All that's great, but to me, what this year is going to be known about more than anything else is the new school really starting to break through. I think the new school really starting to break through this year. And um, that's a perfect segue. You know what? That's a perfect segue into my fight review because let's talk about the new school a little bit. Before we get to what happened Saturday in San Antonio, Texas, and I know a lot of you want to talk about that, we absolutely will. But let's start Friday, June 24th, Kissimmee, Florida. Important fight here. Jonathan Gonzalez defended his uh, junior flyweight belt it was his first defense, a battle of southpaws between him and Mark Anthony Barriga, who I think is from the Philippines. You had a, a Puerto Rican-born fighter out of the Bronx versus, I think, a Filipino fighter. Anyway, um, 
Gonzalez defends this title successfully for the first time. He is definitely a, a player at, in the junior flyweight division. So if you watch the little, little guys, this is one to keep an eye on. All right. So that's what took place on Friday. And then Saturday, June 25th, underrated fighter out of South Africa, Hecky Budler, scored the win over Elwin Soto in Mexico. Soto is a uh, Mexican fighter who has now lost two in a row. He lost his previous fight to Gonzalez, who I just mentioned, and this was his second in a row to Butler. I think this being in Mexico and everything else, this being a Zanford Promotions card, this was in Baja, California, Mexico. It was broadcast on ESPN+, Plus, by the way. If you haven't seen it, you can go check it out. Um, but this was, I would say, a minor upset. I don't know what the betting odds were, but just the location, you know, everything else, you got to think that Soto – was favored to win, right? So Butler, he's had several good wins now in his career. He really has. He's starting to carve out a really good, uh, respectable, professional career. And uh, this, of course, this was a junior flyweight fight, uh, uh, just like the one Friday. There was a knockdown in the 12th round, just a flash knockdown that Butler scored. And that is what really sealed this win for him. The scorecards were really close. And I think they should have been a little wider. To me, this felt like Butler clearly won. It was competitive, but I thought he clearly won this fight. Scorecards were a little too close for my taste. But again, it was in Mexico, Mexican fighter, uh, to my point earlier. So good win from Butler. And who knows? Maybe we could see him against Gonzalez or something like that. But uh, underrated, underappreciated fighter. Uh, out of South Africa. But the big event last Saturday, June 25th, was uh, put on by Matchroom Boxing USA at the Techport Arena in San Antonio, Texas. This was broadcast on The Zone. And before I get to the main event, let's talk a little bit about the undercard. Uh, Julio Cesar Martinez was supposed to defend his flyweight belt, but he pulled out of the fight last minute and uh, screwed over his opponent for the second time in a row. And this isn't the first time he's done this. Just a really unprofessional fighter that is not being um, held responsible for any of his behavior, but he still holds a WBC flyweight belt, which at some point, th this guy needs to be held accountable for his actions. Anyway, he was supposed to be on this card. He wasn't. But Jessica McCaskill successfully defends her undisputed welterweight championship uh, with a stoppage retirement, third round retirement win over Alma Ibarra from Mexico, who... Um, came into this fight with a really, really poor resume. It was just completely outclassed. This was the third defense for McCaskill. The punch stats in this fight, as far as like punches thrown and landed, even in different categories, fairly even. But McCaskill's had so much more impact. It was apparent right away. And uh, Ibarra does not come out for the fourth round. So I'd like to see McCaskill get a little more busy. She hasn't been the busiest fighter in the world since she won this undisputed welterweight championship. I understand what her and her manager slash boyfriend uh, trainer, Rick Ramos, are trying to do. I understand. But I, I would like her just to get a little busier, especially if it's against this level of opponent. She could be fighting girls like this three, four times a year and just stacking up defenses. Maybe that's the best thing they could do right now since there's no elite-level opposition to face. All right, in the co-main event, uh, Murajan Akhmadayalev improves to 11-0 with a TKO 12 win over Ronnie Rios. This was the third defense of Akhmadayalev's unified belts. He has two of the belts at junior, uh, junior featherweight, and, of course, Stephen Fulton has the other two belts. Now, Stephen Fulton is seen as the top guy, Akhmadayalev right behind him. They're the two top guys in the division. I'd love to see them fight. I would favor St <clears throat> Stephen Fulton. I think he's special. I think he could be a pound-for-pound -pound level guy. I think he has those kinds of skills. The only thing he really doesn't have is killer power. Akhmadayalev does have good power. Definitely better than Fulton. But Fulton probably does everything else a little bit better. You know, Still, I'd like to see the two of them fight. But Fulton is with PBC and they're not going to make this fight. They're just not going to, even though they would be favored. I understand Akhmadayalev doesn't really bring in uh, a whole lot of money internationally. Uh, he does bring in some. He does bring in some. But for Fulton, it's not as if he has a whole lot of options. I mean, I, I guess unless he wants to move up to 126, which he could do, but at 122, why not try to go for undisputed? 
And I, I just really hope that both sides could do this. Eddie Hearn, who represents Akhmadiyalev, they said that they want it. Stephen Fulton on his Twitter account says he wants it. Well, let's see what happens. But I, I'm not going to hold my breath, but it would be great. Anyway, uh, Akhmadiyalev drops Rios in the 12th round, and the ref came in and stopped it. Uh, coming into this fight, Rios had been on a pretty good run lately. He had scored some good quality wins coming into this fight, had some good momentum, always gives a great effort. Good quality prize fighter, right? Experienced, battle-tested. So these were great, great rounds for Akhmadiyalev, who, once again, he's only had 11 pro fights. Fought pretty good opposition in those 11 fights to, to unify two belts. But he needs rounds. He needs professional rounds against experienced battle-tested pros like this. So this was great matchmaking and, and a good quality win top to bottom for Akhmadiyalev. Not that he fought perfect. There's plenty he could still work on, but this was a good win that would make him a better fighter. Uh, according to CompuBox, he landed 52% of his power punches. Anytime you're landing half your power punches, generally speaking, you're going to win the fight. Uh, he was two six. He landed 216 Overall punches, 34 to the body compared to just 93 for Rio. So in terms of the punches landed and everything else, it was fairly one-sided. But Rios was always competitive. He's just a competitive, tough, grizzled kind of fighter. So again, these were good rounds for Akhmadiyalev. Now to the main event, where Jesse Bam Rodriguez Franco, and I, rem- I, re- I realized last week I kept calling him uh, Jesse Franco. It's because... During the show, I was thinking of his brother, Josh Franco, who I've, I've talked to on the phone before. Uh, I, I did a story uh, on, on Josh Franco for uh, Ring Magazine um, a year or so ago. I think it was last year. And um, so, you know, I, I was thinking about him when I said that, but they are brothers, okay? I think they're half brothers. So it's Jesse Bam Rodriguez, but there is the Franco part too. And I just left out the Rodriguez part last uh, last week, so I apologize for that. Uh, so anyway, Jesse Bam Rodriguez improves to 16-0. and 0, The 22-year-old Southpaw from San Antonio scores a TKO8 win over Srisaket Sor Rungvisai. And this is the first defense of Bam's junior bantamweight belt that he won in his previous fight against Carlos Quadras. So, so far, two fights this year for Bam. And two really good wins over two of the high-profile fighters in this very celebrated, internationally celebrated 115-pound division. And um, on paper, these wins look outstanding. And I, I definitely would put him as one of the top candidates for fighter of the year so far for 2022. There's no way he's going to win it. There's no way a guy at 115 is going to win that award, um, at least not this year, when you have all these other big fights I just mentioned, right? The winners of those fights are going to get, one of them is going to get fighter of the year. But you got to put Bam among the top candidates for this award. I really hope we see him in the ring one more time this year. And uh, my boy Steve Kim mentioned it on Twitter. I think it was today. I can't remember if he tweeted it yesterday or today, but I retweeted it today. Uh, He said, and I'm paraphrasing, but basically that, um, you know, Jesse Bam Rodriguez can be a star in San Antonio. And Matchroom Boxing slash Eddie Hearn, they promote him. In fact, they just announced, uh, I think today they tweeted something where they re-upped on their deal, right? Because they know what they got right here. So they re-upped on their contract with Bam. He's going to start making more money now. He's going to be more of a, a featured player for Matchroom, especially Matchroom USA, what they're trying to do here in America. But uh, Steve was basically saying, man, this kid could be a star there in San Antonio because that's a good boxing market. This kid's from there. So is his brother. But most people think, I think Josh Franco's 26 and I think Bam Rodriguez Franco is 22. Uh, don't quote me, but I think I think they're four years apart. But most people feel that he's the better of the two fighters, right? They're both very good little fighters. But a lot of people are excited about Bam Rodriguez. There's a real opportunity here for Matchroom. And uh, that's what Steve was talking about. And I kind of retweeted it and quoted it and, and just added my two cents. Right? If I'm Eddie Hearn... I'm going right back to San Antonio for Bam's next fight. And I have him fighting in San Antonio twice a year 
once in the spring and once in the fall. If you do an interim fight in the summer or anywhere else, cool. Every now and then you might get a really, really big matchup that you want to take to LA or Las Vegas or something like that. Cool. But I would be going to San Antonio twice a year because the pay structure, these little guys fight at there it's, it's, it's affordable. You could put on uh, shows there in San Antonio at a mid-sized venue and probably sell it out. You can build to that. And um, there's so many opponents, man. There's so many possible opponents. So I, I definitely think Matchroom has a real opportunity. And this is the thing about Matchroom Boxing USA. When they first started a couple years ago, they were just signing fighters, right? And they're like, oh, anybody who's American, we'll sign you because they needed fighters. So they signed Daniel Jacobs and overpaid the hell out of him. Um, Demetrius Andrade, right? They lost so much money on Demetrius Andrade. And now they're out of those deals and they can move on. In the midst of all that, though, they invested in some young talent. And now some of the younger guys have come up. And now with Bam Rodriguez is a prime example of a guy they've cultivated a little bit and built up. And they got something there. They really, really do. So, um, you know, props to Eddie Hearn and Matchroom for for getting this one right. And they've got uh, a few young guys like this. So in the next coming years, they can start to build these fighters. But what Eddie's got to do, and I think he understands this, because we've actually, I remember talking to Eddie in Chicago about this for an interview I did for uh, for this channel right here, Ring Ring Digital, um, where he, he said, you know, he understands America is, is a huge country and you have to market a fighter from San Antonio, Texas differently than you market a fighter from Brooklyn, New York or Los Angeles, California, et cetera, et cetera. So hopefully they understand what they got here and they go back to that well over and over because if you build it, they will come and they've got something here in San Antonio. Anyway, I want to talk about this. Um, and my opinion may not be too well received because right now everyone's got bam fever and I get it. I got bam fever too, right? We all got bam fever, but everyone needs to pump the brakes just a little bit, just a little bit because you guys know me. I'm Mr. Consistency. I am Mr. Willing to step over the line and say what's what needs to be said. And there's a few things I have to say about this right now. Okay. Uh, first, I should mention, I should actually get back to the damn fight before I get ahead of myself. <laughs> Rung Visai was knocked down in the seventh round uh, before the fight was stopped in the eighth round by the referee. Uh, what's what's impressive about what Bam does, okay, is his punch selection. And his punch selection is so varied and so great and so crisp because of his footwork. His footwork sets up angles for him that create holes, gaps in his fighters, in his opponent's defense. And he knows the right punch to fill those gaps, right? So, so he will be over here on this shoulder and throwing a, a, a one, two. And as you're reacting and catching that, he's moving his feet and shifting over. And suddenly he's over on this shoulder and he's, you know, posting up on you with his lead hand and shooting an uppercut underneath with the backhand and you don't even see it. Right. And then by the time you react to that, boom, he's gone behind you, spinning you or something else. He constantly moves his feet. He moves his feet while punching. And that just sets up beautiful angles for him. That's what I'm most impressed by. You know, a lot of times in boxing, especially when you're training, it's it's one thing to focus on the combination you're working on and even setting yourself up your footwork to get that combination off. But then it's what do you do after you land it or, or after you shoot it, whether it lands or not, what do you do after that? And a lot of guys get stuck admiring their work. A lot of guys get stuck uh, and they just go 100% defensive or they just completely back out, whatever it is. And for Bam, he's really, really got a great sense of what to do in that little fraction of a second. Okay. I've set myself up. I've gotten my combination off. Now let me follow this up with something else. And a lot of times what he sets it up with is a shift, a pivot, some sort of movement while he has a lead hand out while he's punching and it sets up another power shot. 
He just does it so well. He really, really does it so well. And uh, he did it over and over to rugby side in this fight. So looking at the jabs, I know you guys love CompuBox, so let me give it to you. Uh, Bam landed 114 jabs, only 12 for rugby side. I mean, that's like, that's almost 10 to 1, guys. 10 to 1 in jabs, okay? And then power punches, uh, Bam landed 119 to 72 for rugby side. Landed 54% of all his punches. That's jabs, that's power, that's upstairs, that's downstairs, that's left, that's right. 54%, 66% of his power shots. Those are unbelievable punch statistics. Unbelievable. And keep in mind, this kid is 22 years old. All right. And it wasn't that long ago that he was fighting at junior flyweight. Remember, he moved up not one, but two weight classes recently. So him and his trainer, Robert Garcia, say that they could move down to 112 if they really, really want to and fight there. And that's a wide open division. And I think he could clean that out fairly quickly. There's only one challenge for him there in that entire division, in my opinion. But if he stays at 115, the question is, where do you rate? Bam. Where, where do you rate him? Because uh, clearly he's pat, way past Rungby Sai. And we're going to talk about Rungby Sai in a minute here. But because uh, that's the part I got to get to where people might not like what I have to say. All right. But just hang on a second. Um, you still got Juan Francisco Estrada. You got Roman Gonzalez. You got Ioka. You got Fernando Martinez. And then you got the other Franco brother. Right. Where do you rate Bam in all of that? That's the question. And there are a lot of people saying, well, shit, based on last night, Jesse Bam Rodriguez is the number one super flyweight, junior bantamweight in the world. Number one, no questions asked. Guys, pump the brakes. Pump the brakes. I understand you're excited. I am too, right? America is another young fighter that we can really get excited about. Awesome. Slow down. <laughs> Slow down. Now, head to head. Do I think Bam Rodriguez would have a really good chance to beat this version of Estrada, this version of Chocolatito, even this, you know, Ioka in Japan? Yes, I do. I, I really, really do because of everything I said before. However, he still is not as accomplished as those fighters. He's not. We cannot rate him above those fighters yet. Regardless of how you feel about a head-for-head -head type of matchup, he doesn't have the track record, the resume overall. 2022, yeah, he's got a better resume in 2022 than everybody in the division. Yes, I'm with you. But overall, he doesn't have the record of Chocolatito, Estrada, even Ioka. I mean, come on, guys. So, so back up just a little bit, and let's keep this in perspective, okay? And you guys know me. I say that about everybody. Right, Jerron Boots Ennis, Virgil Ortiz, both are welterweight standouts that we all think are going to be great, great fighters. Boots Ennis could be a guy that is uh, pound for pound number one one of these days. He has that look, right? Certainly, the eye test says all that. It may be head to head right now. You'd pick Ennis to beat Errol Spence or even Terrence Crawford. I ain't mad at you if you have that opinion. I really, really ain't. Okay. But head-to-head -head is not the same thing as ranking. We can't rate Ennis or Ortiz on the same stratosphere as Errol Spence or Terrence Crawford because they haven't accomplished what those guys have. You see what I'm saying? And truthfully, B Bam Rodriguez, he's accomplished a hell of a lot more than Jerron Ennis or Virgil Ortiz so far. He really, really has in terms of the names on his resume. Still, we can't rate him above those other guys. Estrada. Chocolatito, these guys are first ballot Hall of Famers. Chocolatito, in my opinion, is an all-time great level fighter. He should have two wins against Estrada on his record. I strongly feel that way. All right, so, so that's what I mean. We just, just got to pump the brakes just a little bit. I got Bam Fever, too. Trust me. I feel you guys. But let's just slow down just a little bit, all right? Now, I got to talk about this, and it's going to piss some of you off. Because you're going to say, oh, 2020 hindsight, Mike. <laughs> no. I Listen, I picked Bam Rodriguez to win the fight. Now, did I think he would completely blow Rangvisai out? Maybe not like this, but it didn't surprise me. I was impressed, very impressed. The most impressive part is that the kid's 22, 
He was doing this at home. There's a lot of pressure when you fight at home. It was very impressive. Was I blown away or surprised? No, I wasn't. Guys, as I said last week on this show, episode 319, go back, check the record. Teresa Ketsor Rangvisai or Wisaksil Wangek, whichever you prefer, is an old 35. He has not fought since last March. So he was coming off a one-year, three, four-month layoff, right? So, so over a year, almost a year and a half out of the ring. Hasn't fought in the USA outside of Thailand or against a top-tier opponent since he fought Estrada in April of 2019, a fight that he lost. His last win against a top-level opponent was against Estrada in February of 2018. So the wins he had over Chocolatito, and I thought he split. I thought Chocolatito won the first fight. I was there. I was there in New York. I thought Chocolatito won it. But he rugby side clearly won the rematch, obviously. Um, so in my opinion, he went one and one with Chocolatito, and he went one and one with Estrada. All the momentum he had from 2017, 2018, where he was regarded as the number one or number two fighter at 115 for most of that time, is gone. And for the last few years, he's been hanging out in Thailand mostly, fighting nondescript opponents. You know, you go to Box Rec and you look this shit up, it's one star, two star level opponents. And I say that because it's relevant to this discussion. Bam Rodriguez did not beat the Rungvisai that Chocolatito fought twice in 2017, I believe. He did not fight that version of the Rat King. That's not who he fought. He fought a guy five years removed from that. He fought a guy who hadn't fought for nearly a year and a half and hadn't fought against an elite level opponent for three years. Okay, these things matter when we're rating Bam Rodriguez' performance. So that's why I say everyone just chill, pump the brakes. I know I've said that like eight times in this episode. I swear that that was the last time, okay? But I just want to drive this point home that um, I'm excited about this kid. For him to perform this well at 22 years old, all the pressure, everything else, extremely impressive. I I really do think we have a, a future star in our hands. Do I ever think he's going to be a crossover superstar type fighter? No, he's 115 pounds. Here in the United States, that just won't fly with casual fans. It just, it just won't. UFC fans, it's, they, can't, they, they can't conceptualize a fighter that weighs 115 pounds. They can't do it. So, like, the casual fan is never going to get into this kid. But fans in San Antonio and, and greater Texas, that area in Texas, Mexican-American fans, diehard boxing fans, they're going to be all in on this guy right? They're going to love this kid. And I think he could win awards and win belts at multiple weight classes. I absolutely believe that. But I really want to see him against a young fighter in and around 115 pounds. That's what I really, really want to see. A high level young kid that's still in their 20s, uh, maybe early 30s. But guys, generally speaking, in those lower weight classes, by the time you're in your early mid thirties, um, you're old. You, you just are. It's not like light heavyweight or heavyweight, you know, cruiserweight divisions like that. Uh, so generally speaking, yeah, once you hit 30, your, your prime is over. So I want to see this kid in there against other young talent. That's what I want to see. But in the meantime, if they can get a fight between him and Chocolatito, him and Estrada, which through the WBC, that might be possible. I would love to see those fights. Absolutely, freaking lutely I'd love to see those fights. And this kid could build up his name fighting those legends, those older legends who might be who are on the downside of their career. There's no might be about it. They are on the downside of their career. And he I, he really probably could beat all those guys. But then I want to see him against again the, the young talent. That's what I really, really want to see out of this kid. All right, so that's how I feel about that. I know I probably triggered a few of you with that because right now everyone's just seeing the positive. And what is it called? Recency bias? I understand it. But it could be a powerful, powerful, powerful thing. People could get drunk off that. And I just think some of you guys need to just pull back a little bit. All right, I missed a couple of Super Chats. So let me get to them super duper quick. Uh, super chat from Sam. Hey, thank you so much, brother. He says, Bam was great, 
but SSR got old, too slow shot. Yes. And Sam, I, I, you know, I mentioned that on Twitter and a few guys kind of got at, got at me and were like, Hey, how can you say that? You know, look, it was pretty obvious if, if you just watch the fight, uh, rugby side was his feet were slow. He, he, his punch output dropped vastly. I can't remember CompuBox. Uh, yeah, I don't have the numbers, but CompuBox actually sent out, you know, they sent out a thing to all of us and they'll put a little notes in there and they talked about the precipitous drop in Rung V size average punch output per round in this fight versus his entire career. It wasn't as if it was 10%, like it was like half. When the punch output drops, when you can't let your hands go, that's the first sign that you're an old shot fighter. And that's that's just where Rungvi size at. I think that was pretty clear. Still, all that being said, a fighter of that level, just the, the experience that he brought in and, and all the things he has seen and done in this sport, for a 22-year-old kid to, for lack of a better term, whoop his ass like that, it was pretty damn impressive. And I got to say this too. It was actually Rick Glazer who tweeted this, and I retweeted it. I had to. Um, it, and again, I'm paraphrasing, but he basically said that, you know, Bam Rodriguez, his two wins this year are, are better than Javante Davis's entire resume. And you know what? He's right. They're also, and I think he mentioned uh, Demetrius Andre in that tweet as well. Those two wins that Bam had this year are better than Andre's entire career and Javante Davis's entire career. This kid at 22 has already done more than those fighters. And I, I think Davis is in his late 20s and Andre might be in his early 30s. And this kid's already, this kid already has two better wins than they do. Pretty crazy. Pretty crazy. And I know some of you guys out there will say, well, Mike, isn't Gervonta Davis beating Leo Santa Cruz kind of the same thing as Bam Rodriguez beating Sor Rungvisai? On the surface, yes, although I'd say Sor Rungvisai at his best was a lot better than Leo Santa Cruz. But more than that, Leo Santa Cruz was moving up in weight against Gervonta Davis. Okay, Santa Cruz, his best work was two or three divisions before uh, uh, under where he fought Davis. Let's not forget it's Bam who recently moved up in weight and has and fought a much larger quadras, much larger rung visai. So it's the opposite actually. So for that, for that reason and others I could point to, um, I, I actually think that what Bam did against rung visai is far more impressive than what tank Davis did against Santa Cruz, who has, you know, the biggest name, on Tank's resume. All right. Uh, another super chat from Anthony Santiago. Thank you so much, Ant. He says, what's up, Mike? I'll be going to your motherland for a month this Thursday. Whoa, for a month, dude? Oh, my God. I'm jealous as hell. He says, great performance by Bam. I don't think it would be a good idea to put him in with Chocolatito now, though. Yeah, I hear you, man. Well, first of all, if you're going to Italia, you got to let us know where. What, what, like what part? Uh, actually, um, Terry Moss, friend of the show, Terry Moss, the the head of Buckhead Fight Club here in Atlanta. Um, I've fought on her shows. I've done commentary for her shows. She was just over in Italy for like a week or two. And um, just she was sharing a lot of photos and stuff. And uh, man, I'm jealous. I'm so freaking jealous. And now you're going for a month, bro. That's crazy. So we got to know where, dude, because, you know, are you going to be up north? You're going to be in the south. You're going all over the place. Um, yeah, please give some details. But um, generally speaking, I agree with you about Bam. Listen, just because he beat a completely shot Rang Visai, and a, if we're being honest, a past his prime Quadras, who's lost now, what, two, three in a row, something like that? He's lost most of his recent fights, if we're, if we're being honest. So um, great wins. This kid's developing, but he is 22. And I'm with you, man. Um, Get him in there maybe against a, a mandatory opponent or, you know, a stay busy fight. Get him back in San Antonio later this year or something. Maybe set up a fight with Chocolatito uh, early next year or, or same thing with Estrada. But I would definitely would not be in a super duper rush. I think people are jumping the gun a little bit saying that he'd like tune those guys up. Would he have a chance to beat them? Yes, he absolutely would. And I really think it would be the footwork and the punch output is why he would have a really, really good chance to beat them. But those guys are just on another level, man. They really, truly are. 
And if we're being honest about Rungvi Sai, his whole career has kind of been up and down. You know, he had a couple of really, really quality top wins against Chocolate Tito and Estrada. There's some other good wins in there. But if you look at the majority of that guy's resume, it's one-star opponents in Thailand, if we're being honest. And he has fought really, really at high levels at times. And then there's been other days where he's kind of showed up and just laid an egg. So he's one of those up and down fighters, but he really looked finished. Really, really looked finished uh, this this uh, weekend in San Antonio. All right. Oh, here we go. Ant says he's going to Rome, Florence, Venice, Naples. Five steps, Dolomites. Man, Dolomites, I should say. Uh, that's Dude, that's awesome. That's awesome. You are fine. Oh, God, you're so lucky, man. Wow, so I'm just looking here. You're mostly, yeah, no, you're going to the south too. Okay. And be careful in Naples, bro. Depending on the na- part of Naples you go to, it can get a little rough. Everywhere else you're going, you're going to have a great freaking time. But uh, yeah, just, you know, watch yourself in Naples. <clears throat> Sam with another super chat. Thank you again, Sam. He said, uh, focused Martinez versus Bam at 112. Great fight. I agree. Uh, I'd like to see that fight, but I will say this um, for Bam. I'd want that fight in America and Texas, and I would want Vada testing. And I would want to really, really, really monitor what Martinez is doing. And I'm just going to put it at that. Martinez is a cheater. I'm just going to put it. I don't give a shit if people get mad at me. It is what it is. I don't give a damn anymore. No more Mr. Nice Guy. It is what it is. I'd want to watch that guy very, very closely, his whole team. And I'd want Vada testing. And I would want something written into the contract to where if he came in overweight or he pulled out of the fight, there would be financial compensation for Bam and his team. I just wouldn't trust working with that guy. I just wouldn't. But uh, I'd love to see the fight in terms of styles. Okay. Oh, I got to block a user from the chat here. There we go. Just had to block an asshole. All right, let's get into the fight preview. Uh, All right, so uh, I'm going to cover, again, for those of you just getting on, I I, I mentioned this right at the top of the show, but I'll mention it one more time. We're not doing a Friday wrap-up on my channel this Friday. I'll be traveling, and we're not doing TNC next Monday because it's the July 4th Independence Day holiday here in America. I will be with my family this weekend. I'll be doing like a four-day weekend visiting some family and hanging out. I'll still be training, won't be drinking. I won't be eating cake and all the cannoli and all that shit. I'm going to be eating healthy and training, but I will be hanging out with family. So next Monday, no show. So for that reason, I'm going to preview two weeks worth of of fights on the schedule, okay? So let's start uh, this Saturday, July 2nd. And we got a couple of cards here that were picked picked up by ESPN+. Plus. They originally had no uh, broadcasting here in the United States, but they were picked up at ESPN+. Plus. So this is great value here if you're a subscriber to that app. So let's start over in London, England at Wembley Arena. Frank Warren, Queensberry Promotions, Joe Joyce, 13-0, going up against Christian Hammer in a WBC heavyweight eliminator. This is interesting. Very, very interesting. Who holds the WBC heavyweight championship belt right now? None other than Tyson Fury, correct? Who claims he's retired. Okay, maybe he is. I don't believe it. I don't. I think most of you don't believe it either, right? But uh, Joe Joyce is his countryman, is a fellow Englishman. So if he were to win this fight, which he should, um, you know, he's a heavy, heavy favorite. That would set up an interesting, interesting fight. Um, just in terms of styles, call me crazy. I'd welcome a Joe Joyce fight against uh, a challenge Joe Joyce against Tyson Fury next spring. I'll take it. But even if Tyson Fury truly does walk away, if Usyk beats Anthony Joshua in the rematch, which I think he will, he should, Fury might really truly retire. He'll definitely dump that WBC belt. Then at that point, You know, Joyce will fight for the vacant title, probably against Andy Ruiz or something like that after he beats Luis Ortiz uh, later this year. So interesting possibilities. But, I'm, you know, I'm a fan of Joe Joyce. I know a lot of people shit on him and don't like his style. He's kind of slow and all that. 
I actually think he's underrated. I've said that a thousand times on the show. Anyway, uh, he has not fought since last July when he stopped Carlos Takam. So uh, he's been out of the ring for about a year, about a year. So this is a long layoff for him. Um, Hammer has fought three times since then over that same span over the last year, but he's lost two of the three. Somehow he's in a WBC eliminator. How? I don't know. I don't know how a guy could go one and two in his last three fights and his only win was against a one-star level opponent and he's in a WBC heavyweight title eliminator. I don't know how that happens, but it happened. Anyway, Joyce Hammer uh, is going to be on ESPN Plus and that will be on at 2 p.m. Eastern time here in the States. So 2 p.m. Eastern time here in the States, you can watch that fight. Also on this card, you got Jason Cunningham versus Zolani Tete. Tete, every time I hear that name, I just think of like, anyway, <laughs> I take a look. You guys remember uh, in Living Color, uh, Men on Film, that skit that they would do with, uh, oh my God, I had Damon Waynes and um, uh, who's, who's the other dude? He's from, the, he's from Michigan. He's a Michigan guy. Oh, I can't think of his freaking name right now, but they were like two gay dudes talking about film and shit. I just tie tie when I hear it, I just think of like anyway, Damon Wayne's and yeah, he could totally pull it off. Anyway, Zolani Tete has titles. He has won titles before at 115, 118. He recently moved up to 122. That's where he's going to be fighting Jason Cunningham. So it'll be interesting to see how Tete looks at 122. Also on this card, Callum Johnson, light heavyweight out of England, who has only lost once in his career. It was to Artur Beterbiev in 2018. No shame in that. And he actually hurt Beterbiev in that fight. Going up against Russian German Igor Makalkin. Uh, 10-round light heavyweight fight. So that's the 2 p.m. Eastern fight a card from London that um, ESPN is going to pick up. Now, they also picked up a card from Australia that they're going to be broadcasting live at 5 a.m. Eastern time. So you got action at 5 a.m. Eastern and 2 p.m. Uh, Eastern from ESPN Plus this Saturday. So Dean Lonergan, DNL Events, This is that's the promoter. I have no idea who this is. No disrespect. I just don't know who this is. Dean Lonergan, DNL Events, is putting on a card at the Gold Coast Convention Center in Queensland, Australia. And in the main event, Marius Bradis, remember him? He is defending his IBF cruiserweight belt. That's the only belt he has left. Uh, going up against Jai Opetaya, who is a uh, local there to Australia. Let's talk about Opetaya real quick. 21 and 0, 17 knockouts, 26 years old, six foot three, Southpaw prospect out of Australia, fought for Australia in the 2012 Olympics three-time Australian national champion as an amateur. So this guy has a pretty good pedigree. He actually has a legit boxing background, and uh, he will be going up, obviously taking his greatest challenge to date, massive leap in opposition, going up against Bredis for a legitimate cruiserweight belt. And Bredis is seen as the legitimate top cruiserweight in the world. Let's talk about Bredis real quick, though. What has happened to this guy? You know, after that great fight he had with Alexander Usyk in 2018, gave Usyk the toughest fight of his career to date. He really, really did. And um, style-wise, he just gave Usyk some fits. Usyk, it, was, it wasn't his best night. Still, you know, for Bredis, he came up a little bit short. It's his only pro loss. That was like four years ago, a little over four years ago, I believe. He came back, won season two of the World Boxing Super Series, the Cruiserweight, belt, right? Their, their second tournament at cruiserweight. So that was a great accomplishment, but there were, there was COVID the pandemic and there's been delays in his career. I get all that, but I just feel that his, the momentum he kind of had has stalled a little bit. He has spent most of the last year. I feel calling out of all people, Jake Paul on social media. He's posted like bizarre social media videos. One was like a rap song where he was calling out Jake Paul of all the people he could call out, right? He's not calling out for a rematch with Usyk or any other fight. He wants Jake Paul. So it's just kind of bizarre. In 2021, he only fought once against a journeyman level opponent 
And now this is his first bout of 2022. And this is a guy from Latvia, right? He's fighting in Australia with a promoter and a promotion that I've never heard of. So this is all just kind of bizarre to me. And it's, it's difficult to understand. Uh, you, you look at where this guy once was and where he is right now. And it's, I don't know what happened to the dude, all the momentum kind of went away. Now for Opataya, uh, he's been inactive since COVID as well. He hasn't been very active himself. Currently rated number four by the IBF. So he's highly rated by the I IBF, but I checked it. He's not a mandatory. There's no mandatory right now. In fact, there's not even a number one rated uh, contender for the IBF at Cruiserweight. Number one's vacant. The IBF will do that. They'll have a vacancy randomly at different spots in their top 10. And right now, at least the last ratings I've seen, Opataya is ranked number four. So again, I just don't quite understand what's happened with Bradis and why he's going this route. But maybe he's getting paid super duper well, but he's fighting in a convention center in Australia. I, I don't know. I, it, he could make more money there than he would make in his home country in Latvia. I don't know. Uh, maybe COVID or something. I, I don't know what's going on there. Anyway, that will be on ESPN Plus, 5 a.m. Eastern uh, this Saturday. Now, next Saturday, July 9th, there's two cards of note. Let's start in uh, San Antonio, Texas. Back to San Antonio. This time it's Showtime. PBC on Showtime from the Alamo Dome in San Antonio. Mark Magsayo going up against Ray Vargas. Uh, Magsayo defending his featherweight belt, I believe, for the first time. He beat Gary Russell Jr. back in January to take this belt. And now he'll be defending it against Ray Vargas, who had a belt at um, 122 and defended that belt several times, but never really got any big fights. Could never get a big fight in the, and a big opponent in the ring with him, whether it was him not wanting a big fight or his management. It just never happened. So this is his second fight at 126. On paper, this is an interesting matchup. For Magsayo, uh, Vargas is a tall, rangy guy, very experienced, and stylistically may give him more problems than Gary Russell Jr. sure did because Gary Russell Jr. is so little. He's almost a midget. No disrespect. He's just very, very little, tiny little arms and stuff, right? The T-Rex arms. And I Vargas has these long arms. So um, it could give him some problems, but this fight also could get really ugly. Vargas has done that in some of his fights. So we shall see. Um, but yeah, it, it's just an interesting matchup, an interesting choice of venue for these guys. Anyway, um, same day, London, O2 Arena, Matchroom Boxing, putting on a card that will be broadcast on the zone. And it's a rematch that really nobody called for, but on paper, it's a it's an entertaining matchup at heavyweight between Derek Chisora and Kubrat Pulev, who fought in 2016. For you math geniuses out there, that's six years ago. And Pulev won a split decision in that fight. It was a close fight. Chisora has had a lot of those close kind of fights that he's just come up short in. And these guys are doing a rematch in 2022. On the surface, Pulev should win this fight. Even though Chisora is fighting in his, uh, you know, his home country and everything else, Pulev fighting on the road. Pulev's only lost twice in his career. You know, I do think he is a somewhat underrated heavyweight. He only lost to a prime Vladimir Klitschko. Well, maybe just coming off his prime Vladimir Klitschko and, um, and Anthony Joshua. That's it. Those are the only two losses he's had. So um, he, he's a solid heavyweight contender. And he had a you know solid amateur pedigree. He's fought some good heavyweights. And he's done well against most of them. Style-wise, this should be an interesting heavyweight fight. Also on this card, a really good rematch between Israel Madrimov and Michel Soro. These two fought uh, last December. Madrimov technically wins by stoppage. A lot of people did not like the stoppage. It was very controversial. So you're going to get a rematch between these two. Soro gave Madrimov some, some real issues. It was pressing him. And uh, we had not really seen anybody do that with Madrimov. So a lot of people looking forward to this rematch. Obviously, this is the fight I'm looking forward to most on this card personally. And also on this event, uh, undefeated prospects out of England, Fabia Wardley, 13-0 heavyweight, 
and Felix Cash, 15 and 0 middleweight. So that's a pretty uh, fun little entertaining card there from Matchroom. Good domestic card over there in uh, London. So that will be fun. All right, guys. Whew, that's it with the fight Re uh, preview. I'm about to say review. Now let's check on these super chats real quick. Want to make sure I didn't miss anything. I think we got another one from Sam. Thank you, Sam. He says, Ray Vargas, most boring fighter like Ray Gondio. Yeah, he definitely could be confused for being the Mexican Ray Gondio. You could, you could say that. And he could turn this fight with Mike Sayo into a really, really boring fight. Um, we shall see. <laughs> Keith says, uh, midget lives matter. <laughs> if you know, you know. Guys, look, I'm probably going to get this video will be demonetized. Uh, well, actually, it isn't even a monetized video because we don't do that here. So so screw it. I'm going to let it rip. So there, there's a midget wrestling tour that goes around America. And I just, I, I love midgets. They're hilarious. They're just, they're awesome. And they came here to Atlanta. And so me and the wife went last year. It was actually uh, right after one of my fights. So I was able to like have a couple beers and relax and really enjoy it. And it was hilarious. And they had one dude who came out who looked like 50 cent, but they called him 25 cent. And I took a picture with them and uh, they had t-shirts there that said midget lives matter. So of course I bought one and I took a picture with a few of the guys posted it on my uh, Instagram. It was just outstanding. It was hilarious. And if they ever come back through town, we're going to see him again. Had a great freaking time on that note. Um, yeah. Let me make sure I got through all my stuff. Yes. I think we can get to some phone calls. So let's do that. All right. We got, it looks like Jack on the line. No doubt. There's going to be some triple G Canelo talk. All right, Jack, you're on the line. What's up? Uh, no, this is a uh, patch from Bateman. And, uh, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, yeah, it is. It is Jack. Um, I was going to come up here. I'll, every time I come on the show, I need to be like gun to your head five seconds. And then name a matchup. So, gun to your head, five seconds. Uh, Nakatani versus Bam Bam, 113. Or 115. I, no, or 113. Or 112. Uh, I'm yeah. going Bam decision, but it's 115, 113. It's close. Interesting. Uh, people are really sucking his dick over this. I mean, he showed a lot of stuff. But when somebody, like, you want to know, like, David Benavidez, uh, fucking dig and when David Benavidez beat, a fate of the Mew. Everyone was treating him like he was a god. You know what I'm talking about? Everyone was yeah. like, oh my god, he's, this, is, this is the next <laughs> Muhammad Ali. Right. <laughs> I was like, he just beat a fate of the Mew. Come on. But um, now Bam impressed me and uh, not trying to be a dick or anything, but dude, do you think he might be possibly gay? He could be like the first ever gay champion in boxing. Why would you say he's gay? Do you say he something? Just gives, he just gives the vibe. Oh, no, he just weren't the way he dressed, just the way he dresses, just the way he acts. I'm like 60% sure he is. I, I that, have no idea. Just, I don't care. I, I honestly, I don't, I haven't seen or heard anything, so I don't know. Well, well people do. Boxing, boxing is so homophobic. Everyone's such That's a good point. <laughs> yeah, that is a good point. That yeah, would hurt a boxer's marketability, but I've never heard or seen yeah. anything from him that would make me think he's gay. I'm, I don't know. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I'm just saying. I, I haven't seen Yeah, 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 yeah. There, there's not, I don't know. Just the vibe I felt. But, uh, yeah, I didn't want to talk about Canelo Triple G. So I read uh, just now, right before I got on the call, so Triple G, if he beats Canelo, he said he might fight David Benavidez. How would you see that if he topples Canelo? That's a dangerous fight. That's a really dangerous fight. But also I don't like the fact that uh, he's even thinking ahead. If I were a Golovkin, I would just oh, he, oh. all things Canelo right now. No, Jonathan Banks said. Oh, Banks said that. To, face. Uh, yeah, to me, that's just, like, yeah. that's just Banks doing his job as a trainer. Uh, by the way, Nacho in the chat did bring up Emil Griffin, or I think it's Emil Griffith, right? Yeah, um, who was the first oh, openly no. gay boxing <laughs> champion. There was another dude too out of like Puerto Rico or something, but he was just a title holder. He wasn't like a legit champion. It was recently. Uh, now I got to look that shit up because I can't think of his name. And you knew Did that dude Neil was gay. Christ. Orlando Cruz. He's the dude that passed away. Yeah, Orlando Cruz. Did yeah, you, uh, Emil Griffith. Yeah, yeah, he did. Oh, that was that was 
dude, that referee, I don't care if it was like six years ago, that referee needs to be arrested. I mean, he's probably dead by now, but that contest when Emil Griffith was like beaten to death, man, that was just horrible. But, um, I was about to say, oh, no, 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 sorry. I'm thinking of Emil Griffith fighting, who was the guy, he, uh, the terror, uh, Benny Parrott. He apparently, like, they, they like killed, uh, they, he killed him, remember? Yeah, 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 yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't Emil. Um, because he, yeah, he lived to be an old man. He lived, yeah, I'm just looking here. Let me look him up because now I want to make sure. Did he come out when he was? I thought he came out after he was fighting. Not now I'm curious. Uh, he was, oh, he was bisexual. I'm just, I just pulled up his, uh, Emil Griffith's, um, profile. Uh, yeah, he said he said I like men and women both, but um, it's not saying when he came out. So I don't know. One of you guys in the chat can correct me. I'm sure, but I do know for sure Orlando Cruz like came out while he was fighting, and that was I don't know maybe Man. ten years ago or something like that. Yeah. <clears throat> no. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, that's crazy. But anyways, I don't know. He just gives the vibes off. He, he they were showing him in the. Martinez Chocolatito fight before I even knew who he was because I hadn't seen the Quadros fight yet. I said, "Dude, gay as hell." <laughs> <laughs> just the way he dressed, he just maybe. Hey man, a lot of boxers like, dress crazy though, man. Floyd has worn some crazy ass shit. Um, a lot of these guys. Who, who was uh Sebastian Fondura dresses like an accountant, a guy who works for like uh H and R Block. Uh, some of these guys dress real funny, man. But I, I you know who you yeah, know. Yeah. Um, uh, Demetrius Andre dresses like a pirate sometimes. Like he for real looks like a pirate. So, yeah, I'm tall, black, and handsome. <laughs> That's what he says. No, but dude, uh, I wanted to talk about the people keep talking, and I hate this how everyone's comparing Crawford and Spence and Triple G Canelo. So, the, how expensive do you think? So, when the tickets first came out, it was seven hundred dollars for like nosebleed seats. How much? What? Seat in the building for Crawford Spence, you think you could get with seven hundred dollars? Hmm. I guess it would depend on the venue. I do know this: they're going to gouge for those tickets too. They're just going to have a lot of trouble selling them, a lot more trouble selling them. Um, but they're going to sell those those tickets to a different crowd than they're selling to. I think there's going to be a lot more international people coming in with money. You're going for uh, Triple G and Golovkin. You're going to have uh, guys coming in from Mexico with money. You're gonna have guys coming in from Europe, Eastern Europe, Central Asia with money. So they're gonna there's a lot more, there's a bigger international market with that fight. With Crawford and Spence, you're probably gonna have a lot of American entertainers and stuff, you know, gobbling up some of those big seats. But I'm with you. There's no way it does anywhere near the same gate. It just can't. Yeah, and uh, one more thing, because uh, we're on the topic, I never got to ask you this before. Uh Crawford. So everyone talked about, uh, I talked on this, uh, maybe it was like six or seven episodes ago, Crawford versus Tito Trinidad. Bro, Tito Trinidad is one of the most overrated fighters ever. And everyone called me crazy, but I was like, Crawford beats Tito Trinidad. Everyone's going to call me crazy, but he does. Dream matchup, guys, I'm sorry. Crawford beats Tito. Even whatever Mike says, Crawford wins. He beats Tito Trinidad. Just a, just a fact. Uh, so come bring that hate in, everyone. What do you, what do you think of that opinion? <laughs> I think he could. I don't know who I'd favor in that fight, oh! but he could. Crawford could beat Tito. Yeah, he could, of course. Prepare for the comments, bro. But uh, yeah, yeah I'm gonna head out. But uh, <laughs> <All> <laughs> you right, have Jack. a good night, bro. All right, man. You too. Uh, Jack triggered half the chat with the gay stuff. Hey, look, who cares if a fighter's gay? I don't give a shit. But it is interesting because there haven't been that many that would be out. But I haven't heard anything from either of the Franco brothers that would make me ever, ever, ever question, you know, or, or suspect anything like that. Not that any of that shit matters. Sam A with another super chat. Uh, he says, by the way, saw Tears for Fears on YouTube. Phenomenal. Yeah, dude, their new album ain't bad. It's not bad. I, I was actually very impressed that they did a new album. I had no idea until we went to the concert, but it was a lot of fun. And uh, to, to go there and hear some of the new tracks. And of course the old classic tracks from the eighties, man, that shit was, that was a good time, man. That was a really good time. Lots and lots of fun. All right. Oh boy. The chat. Oh man. The chat is definitely lit right now. 
Uh, Skid Row Joe says, uh, corniest dressers in boxing period are the Charlo twins. I don't know, dude. I it, there, There's some really crazy dressers that even make the Charlos look normal. Uh, again, Andre straight up wore an outfit once where he looked like a pirate. I want, I, I thought he was going to have like an eye patch and like uh, a parrot on his, on his shoulder or something. He looked like a freaking pirate. So uh, some of these guys dress crazy. Tyson Fury has worn some crazy shit too. L- look at some of the things the guy, the, Tyson Fury will work out in like booty shorts with his gut and his uh, muffin sludge <laughs> hanging over and his fupa and all that shit out there for everyone to see. I mean, come on, guys. Uh, you know, hey, you want to say, you know, that that's a certain look. OK, you know, to, to Jack's point earlier, <clears throat> that, I'm not that, you know, again, there's nothing wrong with any of this. I'm just saying. All right. Back to the phones. <laughs> Nacho, save us. Nacho, you're on the show. What's up? <clears throat> Yeah, I don't know where he was going with that tangent, but I'm going to leave that shit alone, Mike. Okay. Uh, I think we need to move on from that. Yes. Um, just real quick about the fights this weekend. Um, man, I got to give all the credit to Bam. Did not expect that kind of a performance from him. I thought uh, Sarungvasai would have had more left in the tank, but you could see as the fight went on, he was starting to break him down and he was starting to make him kind of hesitant to, to go in there with Bam. And Bam was just taking away his legs with those body shots and then eventually just, you know, pounded on him and jumped on him and ended up taking him out. I mean, that's a hell of a performance. Some people would probably try to discredit it, saying, you know, he fought a guy who was probably not at his peak, but still, he was a, still a very viable opponent. So I think you've yes. got to give him credit. Absolutely. Um, it's interesting that they keep. It's interesting that uh, Garcia is saying that he wants him to go down to 112 to fight the guys there. I honestly think Mike he beats a lot of those dudes at 112. I don't really think any of those guys can stand up to him. I think the only one who might give him some problems, and it's only because of his style, not necessarily because he's a great fighter. It's uh, Edwards because Edwards is oh, probably Edwards, okay. Ah, uh, yeah, I think Edwards just his style is so tough to deal with it's so awkward and and tough to fight against that i think he would be the toughest guy out of all the bell holders for him to beat i think the other guys are beatable in my opinion i think he can beat uh jc martinez i think he can beat uh nakatani although that would be a hell of a fight though for sure i'm not discounting either one of those two dudes as far as them being able to give him a fight but i think he has a little bit more uh tools in the bag um, than those guys do. And I think he could, he would find a way to beat both of those dudes. Um, with uh, <clears throat> with uh, Akhmad Daliev, um, he put up a good performance. Um, you know, Ronnie Rios is just a guy. I never really thought of him as being like a legit contender. I just think he was just kind of thrown out there as someone for uh, him to defend the belt against. And, you know, Rios put up as good of a fight as he could, but... You could see as the fight wore on, he was just getting taken apart. And the way he was taking him out with those body shots was unbelievable. So, I mean, that was a great fight. Honestly, Mike, in your opinion, do you think there is a possibility that that fight between him and Fulton happens? Or does Fulton leave 22? Uh, I would bet against it. I really would. But I, I'd love to be proven wrong, man. I really hope we can see that fight. Because I, I think... It's yeah. necessary, man. We need to see it. Yeah, I'm on the same boat. I want to see it, but something tells me that someone's going to dig in their heels and, and just someone's not going to let this fight happen, which I think is going to suck if that if that ends yeah. up being the case. Me too. Because I think it would be a really good matchup for sure. And then um, really quick, Mike, the uh, the whole thing with um, the other fight that I talked about, uh, the – Butler and Soto. That was a nice, entertaining scrap between those two guys. Yeah. Um, I was surprised that Butler ended up getting the decision in Mexico. I really didn't think he was going to get it. I thought that they were going to find a way to give it to Soto at the end until the knockdown. The knockdown seemed like it was the difference in that fight. So, I mean, that was kind of that was really interesting how they they gave it to him. Basically, based on that knockdown, was the reason that Butler won. Um, but yeah, it was a it was an entertaining fight. I mean, it, it was awesome to see that fight. Um, with the uh, card that you just talked about, Mike, um, 
the one with Chisora. I mean, at this point, Chisora is just a guy. Like, he's just getting beat up and getting paid to get beat up. I don't think he beats Pulev. I think Pulev would still figure out a way to beat him. I think he's just being, you know, just he's just out there just to get a paycheck at this point. And I don't see him beating Pulev. I think Pulev still has more than enough to beat him. But the other fight is the one that I really want to see is the rematch between Madramov and Soro. I just think that Soro has, um, you know, I think he's got, he might have Madramov's number. Is it possible that Madramov might have been rusty going into the first fight and maybe that's why, you know, he looked bad? I think it's totally possible, but I just think, Mike, that Soro might figure out a way to, to win that fight. I'm picking mm. him oh, to, yeah? to, to pull off the You think he'll win a decision yeah. or you think, think he'll stop him or how do you see it? No, I think more than likely it's going to be a decision because Soro doesn't have uh, power like that to stop okay. Madramov. I think he figures out a way to win a decision, probably maybe eight to four or seven to five. But I like Soro to win that rematch. I do. I just think that he was winning that fight up until that totally illegal uh, couple of punches after the bell that basically saved Madromov. I think Madromov could have lost the first fight had it not been for that. So I'm, I think Soro will definitely be on his game for this uh, rematch, and I think he's going to go out there and, and take it. So, all right, Mike. I know you got other people waiting to call. All right. Thanks, Nacho. Have a good one, bro. Yeah. Two. All right. Another super chat from Sam. A. Hey, thank you, Sam. And uh, back to Jack's uh, comments about Tito Trinidad and Terrence Crawford. Sam says Tito was 40 and 0 and moved up to 160 to fight B Hop. Yeah. Let, let me be clear about this. I would pick Tito to beat Crawford. However, based on styles, I do think it's possible Crawford could upset Tito Trinidad just in terms of styles. Now, perhaps when we finally get the fight between Spence and Crawford, Crawford will be exposed and and, and we'll find out that this has all been smoke and mirrors and Spence will dominate him and win and be Crawford silly. I don't think that's what's going to happen. I I favor Crawford to win that fight. I think two, three years ago, Crawford would have absolutely annihilated Spence. Now it's going to be close. They've weighted him out. Anyway, I think Crawford is a really, really good fighter. And he uses his length and his switch hitting and his accuracy. The things he can do at 147, I think he could upset Tito on the cards. I really, really do. Tito was thoroughly outboxed by Oscar De La Hoya, in my opinion, until Oscar decided to uh, let off the gas. So Tito wasn't like a flawless, perfect welterweight. Damn good one, though. A damn good one. And um, you'd have to favor him against Crawford. But style-wise, again, I keep going to the word style-wise. Uh, you know, Styles make fights. I do think Crawford would have a chance to pull that upset. I truly, truly do. All right. Again, not saying I'd favor it. Not saying that's where I'd put my money if I were betting. I'm saying it would be possible due to the style matchup. That is all. All right, back to the phones. And right, we're going to go to Tony in L.A. What's up, brother? You're on the show. What's going on, Mike? Do you know who's going to be broadcasting the AJ Music fight? Uh, DAZN. DAZN. Well, the Saudis say that they have, oh. they have full rights to the broadcast. Oh, I guess whatever their local uh, – I have no idea, man. I guess whatever their network, network is. <laughs> I have no well, idea. No, I mean, how is the zone customers going to order – I mean, it's not through the zone, right? Well, does does Saudi Arabia have the zone? There's a question because the zone is in 100 <laughs> different countries. Let's see here. I'm clicking I'm, – I'm Googling as we are talking, Tony – Let's see. Watch Extreme okay. <laughs> E in Saudi Arabia on the zone. So they have Extreme E Motorsports in Saudi Arabia. I'm just reading this thing on the zone right here. Um, so you can watch this shit too. Well, I, I, yeah, I don't know if that means it's in Saudi Arabia, but I think it is. Because I'm looking at the excluded regions. Again, I'm just pulling this up on their site real quick. And there's certain countries where things are like excluded. Um, 
but okay. they, they have a broadcast in Saudi Arabia of some race car shit. So I don't know, dude. I, I, I as far as I know, it's a DAZN broadcast, and they're in over a hundred countries, and they are going to have the feed and, and control the whole broadcast. Okay. Uh now how about that division with Bam? If I hear correctly. The WBC is now forcing a mandatory on their franchise belt holder with Chocolatito over his match against Franco. Yeah, I think it's weird. I, I think it's isn't Estrada the franchise champion. I gotta look yeah. this shit up because well, you guys, you guys got me belt, researching a lot of shit if today. He came vacant, <laughs> if, if he came vacant. And then, bam, won the belt. And now he's talking about going down to 112, which so, uh, is sort of like tank going down to 135, you know? If I pull up here, I'm going to share my screen because I'll share this with the guys here uh, on the chat. But um, if you go to the WBC site, boom, they list the champion. The, they call it super flyweight. At ring, we call it junior bantamweight, whatever. 115-pound champion is Jesse Rodriguez. They Boom, they got it right up here. Um, and then they've got number one, the challenger, is Roman Gonzalez. Right? Number two is Rung Visai, who he just beat, so obviously that will all change. Who they don't have in here is Estrada. I believe Estrada is the franchise, so he's out okay. of this. Right. So, because franchise doesn't have mandatories. So, if anything, we could see. I thought, but they're ordering Estrada to fight Chocolatito right now. And he has a mandatory, according to them now. Uh, I don't know. I'm per their ratings right here, because it says right here franchise is Estrada. And it says that their number one uh-huh. mandatory is Roman Gonzalez. So, I guess I would have to look that up, but um, <laughs> you guys are stumping me today with this shit. I can't keep up with these sanctioned body bullshit. But um, from from I'm what they have way. on their no, site, hate- dude, from what they have on their site and the way they've always done it, to me it looks like. And by the way, the silver champion is vacant, which the silver is usually the mandatory. But from what they have here on the site, silver's mandatory or silver is vacant. Estrada is the franchise champ. Roma Gonzalez is number one. So, I don't know. <laughs> I actually don't really count any of those other belts below the world. And the franchise, it more sounds like you're vacating your belt, which makes you sort of lose your undisputed, according to me. I mean, I don't know how you feel about it. Yeah, it's it's all insane. And they, they created that belt for... Canelo Alvarez and uh now they've kind of got a mess with it and it's and they've kind of gone against <laughs> what they said they were going to do already several times and it's just hard to keep up with. I like a lot of things the WBC does. I really really do. But the franchise belt thing is just annoying as hell. I, I just it's annoying. Uh the last one that I want to talk about is right now they're talking about anyway Butler in October to December right now. And in a way, like saying, I'll go to England, you know, <laughs> let's make this fight. Hell yeah. But why is Butler dragging and trying to milk this thing right now? Uh, it could be money related. It could be gamesmanship. It could be a million different things. But as long as the fight happens and it happens this year, I'm good. I just want that fight to happen. And I like it in England. I think that's the best place for it. And um, I'd love, I'd love for it oh, to happen. I hear anyways, uh, anyways, all good for it right now. Like you said, yeah, you want England? Go for it. <laughs> I'll take the. Yeah, out. I mean, dude, he's gonna, he's gonna get paid. He's gonna be undisputed, and he's gonna build his brand in England and fight in front of a big crowd over there. So, like, it's, it's like, um, win, win for in a way. So right now, yeah. I'd, I'd give any demands Butler wants, whatever. It, that's his cash out. You know, within within reason, of course, but he's probably just making yeah. negotiations tough to get you know as much money as he can, which I understand because they know they're going to get their and ass beat. this out. Yeah, they're going to get their ass tapped, <laughs> man. They know I, just, that. 
I just want to see NOA Fulton, and that might be a bridge to unification up there as well. You know what I mean? Because yeah. I do not see uh, the Zone and PBC working together. I do not see that right now. Yeah, I can't see that either. Um, but, you know, look. They'll all work with NOA. Oh, for sure. For the money? At yeah. this division? Yeah. Perhaps. Perhaps. It could happen. But right now, just I want to, you know, I really hope that they can figure out a way for Fulton and Akbadiah live to fight. But you're right. There's just no money in that. Now, maybe uh, in a way next year, if he wants to move up, there's there's a lot of international money in that. But is PBC going to let Fulton well, fight in a way? Are they going to let him do that? I don't know. Uh, I can see Bob and PBC working together. I don't see them working with the zone because yeah, they they've invested a lot of money into those uh those fighters, you know what I mean? Yeah. So they need to make the biggest money fights they can. And right now it's NOA versus Fulton at that division. It's what both top ranked guys and C B C guys wanna see. Yeah. But uh, that's it for this. Uh, have a good four, and I'll talk to you on the next show. All right, man. You too. Thanks a lot. All right, there he goes. Let's jump to the next one. I think this is TJ. Let's see what we got. Uh, two zero one. You're on the show. What's up? Yo, my brother. What's going on, man? What's How up? You living? Good. How about you? Good. 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 Um. You know, I wasn't going to talk about Bud, but since that topic came up, just for everyone listening, I just want people to know <clears throat> how hard, for me, in my opinion, the hardest jump in any weight class, this was what makes or break you, makes you a lead or not, is 140 to that 147. So be real or not, because there's a lot of good fighters that look amazing at 140 that just never make it to 147 because 147 is so stacked with depth and that extra seven pounds those guys are huge and bud did that flawlessly i mean you have pacquiao that did it mayweather but you're talking about some really really good fighters like danny garcia that looked awesome that couldn't cut it at 147 amir khan that mm -hmm. couldn't cut it at 147 Adrian Broner, that was a four-weight world champion, could have cut it out 147. Mikey Garcia, you know, stepped up and just – it just makes it just makes Bud that much more special for people that don't understand the significance. Not only did he jump from 140, he started at 135. Yeah. So, I mean, he's a special guy. And as you touched about with Spence, um, I think he's got too many ways to win, you know. I think he's too dangerous. I understand Spence is huge. Spence got the power. But uh, what makes Bud so special is his ability to adapt. You know, you never see him get hit with the same punch twice. Mm -hmm. He uh, he's constantly changing up in the ring. He's just he he's just you know finds ways to uh, find ways to win. That that's what makes you know somebody like him so special. But um, as far as the fights this weekend with Bam and I have had high praise for Bam for a long time. He's one of those guys that uh, you see him coming up. You like. He, I put him in the category of, say, Shakur and Boots. And, um, man, he, he even, like, succeed, like went far above, exceeded my expectations of him when he completely dominated the racket on the side. And I know Nacho said, you know, uh, well, he didn't really catch, you know, he didn't catch, it's true, he didn't catch Rung the side in his prime. No, but it works the other way, too, because Bam's not in his prime either. He's 22 years old, coming up in weight with That's limited experience. So That's a good point. You're not catching... You're not catching Bam in his prime either. You know, he took a big chance against Carlos Quadro. He took that fight on 11 days notice, never fighting in that weight class before. So, and at a time where there was a lot of doubters saying, no, he's not ready for Carlos Quadro. Look at this kid. He's only 22. This guy's been in there with stacked resume, been in there with the best of them. And, uh, you know, he made it, he made it look like he belonged. Not only that, now people are talking about pound for pound this with this kid. And I know they say it's early, but. I mean, I believe him. I'd buy stock in him, you know. Um, another thing with the MJ fight, people are talking about MJ Fulton. Who would you favor in that fight right now? Curious to know your boxing mind. I would have to, to, I'd have to favor Fulton. 
just in terms of styles, I'd have to favor Fulton and then it'd go the distance. But it, it would, I think it'd be a very competitive fight. And Akhmadilev does have more power. Yeah. Let me say, this is somebody that, that you know, because they both had close fights recently, mm-hmm. right? Fulton had a close fight with Brandon Figueroa. And um, MJ had a close fight with Danny Ramon, who we know Fulton dominated Danny Ramon. But I'm not even convinced that MJ beats Brandon Figueroa. That, to me, would be a really tough fight for him. But we know Brandon, I think he's jumped up to 126 now. He's not fighting at 122 anymore. But, I mean, I would love that fight with Fulton and uh, MJ. And then the winner of that can get anyway. That would be That would be amazing. You know, something like that were to happen. Uh, Raymond Ford looked really good. I don't know if you caught oh, yeah, his did. fight. I forgot to mention him, but he did. He, he looked a, really good. He made a lot of adjustments. I took him his last fight, and uh, I'll be honest with you, I had it a draw. A lot of people had him losing that fight. But from what I heard, he was in he was in camp with Shakur. Uh, Raymond Ford's a Jersey kid. I know so is Shakur. Shakur's from North Jersey, though. Raymond Ford's from Camden. But I heard he was working a lot with Shakur. And... Uh, it looked like it. He was a lot better in the pocket. He used to look very uncomfortable on his inside game, but um, he looked a lot, lot better where he was able to pivot, um, clinch, and, uh, you know, make him miss and make him pay, where before he would get caught with easy shots. Mm-hmm. Uh, but um, my last thing to say about the Chisora fight, Pulev, I don't know why they do this to, uh, to Chisora. They, this guy can't get an easy touch. You know, he's coming off two Parker fights, two sick fight, and now they're putting him in with uh, Puliev. Did you see Puliev's last fight by any chance? The, that was the one on, uh, was it ago. was a Triller? It was one of those apps, right? It was on Triller, yeah, on Fight. I on just fight saw the app. highlights. Yeah. yeah, I didn't see the whole fight. Okay. Yeah, he fought Jerry Forrest. I don't know if That's you know right. about Jerry Forrest. Yeah, I know I, Jerry. I consider him, yeah. Yeah, you know, Jerry, I almost consider he's like an advanced uh, uh, gatekeeper, kind of like Chisora. Yeah. I consider him like an American version of Chisora, you know. Um, he's got arguably three fights on his record that should be wins. Michael Hunter, Zhang, and then uh, Jermaine Franklin, you know. Those should all probably That's be wins. He's a good fighter. Yeah. Liev, at, at 41 years old, made that fight look easy. Couldn't miss with his jab and the right hand down the middle. Similar style to Chisora, I think uh, – Chisora has been looking chinny. Parker dropped him a few times in the last fight. I think Puliev's got his number. I know this is a rematch. They first fought in like 2016 or something, but I think it's going to be even easier this time. For anyone who's listening, I was only two to one on that. I, I think it should be a lot wider because Chisora hasn't won a significant fight in years. I don't even know his last significant fight that he won. No, Puliev, even at 41, he's looking good. And he just fought three months ago, so he's fresh, ready to go. Took yeah, that might be a damage. good value, betting-wise. Um, that might be a good value just to take Pula yeah, by I, stoppage. I think so. I don't see Chisora doing it. He's going to be eating right hands. If you watch the first fight, which I watched recently again, he looked, you know, <laughs> I don't know how he, how he stayed on his feet. First of all, it wasn't a split decision. Uh, the scorecard should have been a lot wider. But you know, hey, hey, Did you watch the gloves off by any chance? But nah, still- man, I, I haven't seen any of those recently. I stopped watching that crap. I mean, yeah, some of them are fun. It's just it's, this, it's just so predictable sometimes, you know. Yeah, well, it's just one I can't even say it on here because it's it's kind of it's kind of raunchy. But uh, you know, I would just watch the one clip. If you just Google it, which is or it looks like he's lost all his brain cells. So you, you just gotta watch. <laughs> you, you won't regret watching it. But all right. Right. he said some some outlandish, but. Some outlandish, just do me a favor, watch it. It's like 30 seconds. Anyone that's listening, absolutely ridiculous. All right. You know, we'll check well, it you out. know it's just the character. Yeah. He sells Anyways, fights, man. Uh, he sells fights. That's it. Yeah, that's July, that's July, July 9th. So in yep. two weeks, should be going. Right, Mike. Always a pleasure. All right, TJ. Have a great fourth, man. Thanks All for right. calling in, brother. All right. Talk to you. Hey, you too. Right. You too, brother. Talk to you. And I saw a couple of you guys in the chat were uh, we talking about Mike Alexander <coughs> Alexander in the chat mentioned Mikey Garcia apparently retiring today. So he didn't really formally announce it, but on his social media profile, Mikey Garcia just it just he changed his uh, profile message or whatever the hell you call it, his headline to retired former boxer, and he you know named his 
his stats and everything, his championships. And so everybody has been tweeting about this. Um, in fact, right before I went live on the show, uh, one of the editors at Ring messaged all the writers like, hey, can somebody you know write something on this and post it to the site? So uh, we probably have something up there right now uh, where you guys can read about it. But yeah, so apparently Mikey Garcia is retired. And um, I figured, you know, let's spend a couple minutes really quickly just talking about this. And then I'm going to wrap up. All right. No more calls because we're running at an hour and a half. I'm going to cut it there. But just looking at his resume, guys, you know, listen, technically speaking, he was a champion in four different weight classes. He was never the champion, though. Remember, I always talk about the difference between a title holder and a champion. Mikey Garcia was a title holder. And for me, it really is like the tale of two careers for Mikey Garcia. When you start out as a prospect, you know, he went pro in 2006 and he started at 130. He was a really, really young kid. And you see, you know, top rank built him up with um, just, uh, you know, typical opposition, how you build guys up. And then he got to a point where he was fighting for, for titles and stuff. And this is back when I think, I want to say these fights were probably on HBO. This is like top rank HBO. And you see him winning a belt at uh, 126 against Orlando Salido. That still might be his best win. It's among his best wins. And then in his first defense, Garcia loses the belt because he came in heavy. He weighed 128 against Juan Manuel Lopez, loses the belt on a scale. This very next fight, he goes up to 130 to fight for a belt there against Roman Martinez, wins that belt, defends it once. And that was 2014. So technically speaking, in 2014, when he went into this litigation with top rank and wanted out of this contract, Mikey Garcia had won two belts, but he de had defended them once. One belt he never defended. The other belt he defended once. Okay. Then he comes back with PBC. And I'm sorry, but a lot of his resume there is complete smoke and mirrors. He wins a belt at 135 against uh, Dijon Zlatikinen. Then he wins a belt at 140 against one of the most overrated fighters in the last 20-some-odd years of boxing, Adrian Broner, criminally overrated fighter, in my opinion. Um, and then he defends it against, uh, let's see, or actually he, okay, let me correct myself. The fight against Broner wasn't for a real belt. It was for a diamond belt, freaking WBC. So he didn't even win a belt in that one. He won his 140 belt against Sergey Lipinets, which was a good win. All in all, that may have been the best win of his career. That may have been Mikey Garcia's best win. Very next fight, he goes back down to 135 and fights Robert Easter. I was actually there for that fight in LA. Uh, good crowd, but it was actually a lot of Easter people that traveled. Uh, from Ohio to LA. I remember that. There were a lot of Robert Easter people there in the crowd there at Staples Center. Of course, a lot of Mikey Garcia people too. But all things considered, that's one of Mikey's best wins. Sergey Lipinets, Robert Easter, they're right up there with Orlando Salido. They're kind of around, you know, same range in Roman Martinez. But then he moves up to 147 and fights Errol Spence. And from there, it's just been basically selling out for money. Around 2018, though, when he went back down to fight Robert Easter Jr., that's right around the time Lomachenko was in that weight class and starting to clean it out. And everybody wanted to see Mikey Garcia fight Lomachenko. That would have been number one versus number two. It would have unified belts. Everybody wanted to see that. And I should mention, technically, when, um, when Mikey went back down to 135 to fight Easter, that was a title unification. Because Easter had the IBF belt, Garcia had the uh, WBC belt. So he unified belts. So he actually unified belts once in his career. But the guy everybody wanted to see him fight was Lomachenko. And instead of fighting him, what he decided to do, he didn't want to work with top rank again. You know, he didn't like his experience with them because they wanted him to fight top fighters. I think they wanted him to fight Yoriokas Gamboa back in the day. And he just didn't want to fight him. Anyway. Um, instead of doing that, he moved up to 147 and really did this pointless fight against Errol Spence. It really was a pointless fight because Mikey Garcia has never really been a welterweight. He was decent at 140, but he his, you know, he needed to stay at 135. That's where he was really good. And he was a solid 140, but a good 135 later in his career. Uh, he was never a welterweight. So this was a pointless fight 
It was a money grab. And then, of course, we see the fight with Jesse Vargas, and then he gets beat by Sandor Martin. So um, let me look, because one of you guys just said um, that Mikey Garcia changed his profile. I didn't see who it was, but I just saw a message in the chat here. Uh, so, okay, <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at his Twitter right now, and it doesn't say he's retired. So he changed it. So who the hell knows if Mikey Garcia is retired or not, but people are tweeting about it. Who the hell knows? I don't know what to make of it. My whole point was Mikey Garcia might make the hall of fame one day, but he's not a guy I would vote for. I think that the Los Angeles media, which is the center of boxing media now in the United States, um, they, they, probably will vote him in. He's a media darling in Southern California. I wouldn't though. I wouldn't vote for Ricky Burns, who's a three division title holder. I wouldn't vote, uh, vote for Adrian Broner, who's a four division title holder. These guys won titles in multiple weight classes, but they were never the guy, the man, the champ at any weight class. It's a lot of smoke and mirrors with some of these guys. And Mikey just wouldn't get my vote unless it was an incredibly weak year and there was just nobody else to vote for. But there are other guys that have been passed over a bunch of times that I think I would vote for them. Some of those guys who maybe have been on the ballot for several years and haven't been able to get in, they probably get in on a year where Mikey Garcia hits the ballot. He's just not a guy that's going to get my vote because – he just hasn't had um, that kind of career. Would you say it was a Hall of Fame career? And I'm not trying to hate on Mikey Garcia. He was uh, a very, very, very good technical fighter. Truly, truly was. However, he avoided the top opposition from 126 all the way up. Even at 147, which he had no business fighting there, it's not as if he fought the absolute top guys. When he fought Errol Spence, that was 2019. You could make an argument by then. Some people rated um, Errol Spence number one at that time. I didn't. Uh, you guys got to remember at that time, there were several other fighters in that division, including Terrence Crawford. I think uh, Manny Pacquiao. Those guys were around. So, you know, Errol Spence, I think, had just won his IBF title at that time. And that's all he had. But, yeah, dude, I, I just. So Nacho in the chat says his best win was against Lippin Yetz. Yeah, probably. Probably, but mark my words, guys, Mikey Garcia might make the Hall of Fame one day. And a big part of it will come down to demographics and where he's from. He's from the L.A. area. That's where the media is now. Um, the greater West Coast area, if you include L.A. and then out to Las Vegas, that's Mikey's region. And a lot of those guys, I can tell you right now, I've had conversations with guys before that said they will vote for him. Anyway, whether he's retired or not. Decent career, solid career, not a Hall of Famer. That's just my opinion. All right, guys, have a great week. Have a great holiday weekend for my American friends. And we will see you back at the end of next week. So next Friday, Friday wrap-up on my channel, Montero Unboxing. The next episode of The Neutral Corner, TNC, will be here on the Ring Digital YouTube channel Monday, July 11th. All right, guys, have a good one. Peace.